All right, um, I'm going to go ahead and kick things off now. Uh, welcome everybody to the OpenXLA community meeting. Um, thanks for joining this morning for those of you on the uh, West Coast and at other hours for people joining from elsewhere. Um, so we always kick off these meetings uh, with a mission statement. What is OpenXLA and what are we trying to build? Um, we are building an open state-of-the-art ML compiler ecosystem collaboratively with hardware and software partners using the best of XLA, ERI, and MLAR. And we normally kick off our uh, monthly community meetings with welcomes and introductions. So first off, I'd love to hear from uh, any new employees, who, or sorry, not employees, um, community members who uh, are here uh, for the first time. So if you'd like to introduce yourself, please feel free to say so, your name, your organization, um, and otherwise feel free to introduce yourself in chat if that feels more comfortable. Yeah, I can go first. Um, so this, I'm Prava, I'm from Meta, and I'm actually uh, taking this over from my colleague, Alisma. So many of you may have worked with her. Um, look forward to learning more about this and, uh, and Thea, um, you know, we'll connect soon. Awesome. I'm good to have you here. Thank you. Cool. I, I can go. Um, so I'm Daniel Sitanaka. I'm head of machine learning at a company called Edge Impulse. Um, we build tools for helping developers build and deploy models to the edge. Um, I'm pretty excited to be here. It's cool to see some um, some friendly faces as well. And um, thanks to Magnus at Google, who uh, let me know um, that this was going on. I've also brought a, a colleague, um, Matthias, who is, is in here too. Um, but we're very excited to learn about what's going on with OpenXLA and see ways that we can contribute and, and make use of the tools that are being built. Cool, then I can continue. Uh... I'm Matthijs, uh, Dan already introduced me a little bit. Um, I'm a principal engineer at Edge Impulse, and we are curious to learn how XOA can um, potentially help us deploy machine learning models to uh, embedded devices. Uh, yeah, I can go now. Hi, hi, hi everyone, I'm, I'm Ajay. I work at Walmart and I'm pretty new to this area so i will be just learning a lot of things over here awesome welcome ajay and matthias hi i'm raju uh, i'm ufa student university of alberta doing my msc and uh, machine learning hardware so uh, we are like using different techniques and data flows to develop the hardware accelerators and we are testing on FPJ. Now, uh, I want to see how OpenXL can be useful to uh, compile the large size networks. Awesome, welcome, Raju. Hi, uh, I'm Mark Gacho. Uh, I'm a senior principal engineer at Samanova, doing hardware architecture and some compiler work there. And I used to be at Google working on the TPU hardware team a few years ago. Um, so I'm interested in OpenXLA to see how um, it can help our uh, ML compilation tasks for our uh, data flow processor. So, and uh, I worked with XLA team in the past, and I know how awesome XLA is. So I'm excited about OpenXLA. Thanks for sharing. Um, welcome. We also have uh, Shuhan from Apple who uh, piped up in the chat as well, um, and. I think in the interest of time, I'm going to move on, but please feel free to introduce yourself in chat if you haven't done so um, and haven't gotten a chance. Awesome. Okay, so uh, some basic housekeeping, um, how we collaborate with each other in uh, OpenXLA. Our primary point of contact uh, on a regular basis is this meeting. Um, it happens monthly on Zoom. For now, um, every third Tuesday at 8 a.m. PT, um, now that's PDT. 
So proposed agendas are shared by um, the host, of, oftentimes me, in the OpenXLA community repo. We have a meetings directory there. Um, and also on our mailing list, OpenXLA Discuss. Um, our meetings uh, minutes and slides are shared publicly in the meetings archive there, and you can also find their links to uh, the meeting recording that we upload to YouTube on our OpenXLA channel. Um, so for these community meetings, and this is a little bit of a shift from, from before um, we had the Erie Project join, um, we're uh, focusing these meetings on higher level updates across Stable HLO, Erie, and XLA. Um, those can include development updates, um, new design proposals, and topics of interest to the wider community. Uh, we also have identified the need to do additional technical deep dives um, to talk about, you know, implementation details for some of those RFCs um, and uh, lower level technical work streams. And we're going to schedule and announce those as needed um, in the OpenXLA Discuss mailing list. And if you click uh, the link to that mailing list, you're free to join. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of our new project communication channels later in the meeting. Um, so now we will be kicking off some of our technical presentations. First off, we're talking about the new updates to the OpenXLA XLA, um, contribution workflow um, that the team has put a lot of effort into um, standing up after XLA was extracted from uh, from TensorFlow TensorFlow earlier this year. Um, I'll give it to you, David. All right, awesome, thank you. Yeah, this should be a quick one. Uh, just wanna highlight some of the improvements um, and just show some of the progress that we've made. So next slide. So our goals are really simple. We just wanna improve the David, ergonomics. Sorry, can I pause you really quick? Um, mm -hmm. Do you have other audio input you could use? Because you sound like um, Let's see. Let me. I can. I can look for that real quick. Sorry about that. No, all good. Um, I that just changed it. Oh, okay. Okay. Cool. All right. Sorry about that. No worries. So yeah, our, our goal is really simple: just improve the ergonomics of contributing to XLA, reduce the the you know total turnaround time for a PR, and reduce especially some of the confusion that stems from Google tooling in particular. Uh, for example, Copy Bar is what we use to copy uh, the code from internal to GitHub, and there's some sort of sharp edges there that need documenting and also require our work to sort of smooth out and make the experience better. Um, next slide, please. So some quick already landed improvements. Now we have every internal change exported as a PR. So all of internal development should be visible externally. Uh, extra tests run internally to avoid rollbacks on PRs because it's always a huge pain when uh, someone takes a ton of time to make a great PR and then it gets rolled back due to some internal tests that we're not even running externally. So we're trying really hard to avoid that situation. And rollback descriptions have been updated to be more clear. Um, if anyone here has, has contributed to TensorFlow, this is a, a pain point there as well. Uh, so before the this would have said reland restrict application of simplify reduce of concat, but this is actually a rollback of a rollback. So it's a little bit confusing and sometimes the tooling doesn't do the right thing here and gives a, an inaccurate description. Um, so the, the new workflow now accurately will say rolling back uh, correctly and it will even show you the commit that got reverted. So even if the description is still messed up, you can at least verify, okay, this is exactly what's getting reversed. Um, next slide, please. Um, and then coming soon, we're, we're going to be testing against Jackson TensorFlow on the external CI so that we can be even more sure that uh, when a PR is reviewed that we know ahead of time before it gets copied internally, anything like that, that it's going to be, it's going to be good. We want to minimize overall the, uh, any, any friction that comes from after the PR is approved publicly. Um, it really should be a completely smooth process once it's been approved publicly. We want to minimize the back and forth between, oh, some 
internal test failed, things like that. We're really trying to avoid that here. Um, automatic notification of a Git on, on the GitHub PR when the associated commit is rolled back. Um, that's another thing that's been problematic in the past is that the rollback doesn't notify the PR author that this happened. So you, you know, may not even realize this is what's happened and maybe nobody even noticed because sometimes these rollbacks happen uh, automatically. So it's not even a person who could notify you. Um, we also wanna make sure that there's better attribution of changes made internally at Google. Uh, that's another big issue that we've noticed as well. And just better documentation about copy bars, confusing bits. Uh, for example, right now, PRs don't say that they're merged, even when that's the, the effect uh, that's happened, is that the, the PR has been accepted and the, the code change has landed. Copy bar does not call that a merge. And there's a lot of just silly, confusing things like that that we need to work on documenting better. Um, next slide. And most importantly, uh, we want to hear from you if there's anything that that I didn't mention here that you, you is jumping out to you that, that you want to be improved. Um, I, I've started an issue to track some of this work so we can we can see the progress. And uh, I guess I guess I'll leave it at just I, I look forward to seeing any PRs. Um, really excited for for more more PRs. So thanks. Thanks, David. Um, do, does anyone have any questions? Um, I have a question. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so for folks that are um, have previously contributed or are used to contributing to um, XLA under TensorFlow, is the intent to have all of those PRs now landing in OpenXLA slash uh, XLA at this point? Or That's a great one? question. Yeah. yeah, that that would be that would be great. Uh, I think at this point we would prefer to to have them come via the the XLA standalone repo. Um, we haven't disabled PRs on TensorFlow yet, so there's nothing stopping anyone if they have. Uh, you know, right now I think that it's sort of ongoing what we're going to do in that situation. But right now, for example, you had a cross cutting change where you wanted to make a change to TensorFlow and XLA at the same time. That should that should still go in TensorFlow. Um, but if there's anything that just touches XLA, we would love to have it in the standalone repository. Awesome. I, I have one more question. Um, are there particular areas um, of contribution that would be most helpful uh, to XLA right now? That's a good question. I don't have an answer for that off of the top of my head, but I'll think about that and put it in chat if, I, if something comes to me. Awesome. Sounds great. Um, thanks again, David. Any other questions? Yeah, I had one. Um, right now, the XLA code still kind of mirrored over in the TensorFlow repo. Is there a time frame when that will stop happening? Like, yeah, and, so, like TensorFlow will, will pull it in, like like the other things, right? Yeah. So there are there are some quirks that will prevent it from. So let me say this, the current, the current situation will change soon. We're not sure exactly when there's some very particular issues with, with Basil that we're dealing with. Um, I, I, would, I would expect in the next, let's say couple of weeks to a month that that will change. Um, and then at, at that point, it will sort of, it'll be how you expect where XLA will live in third party and then TensorFlow will Take a dependency on the the you know the XLA Basil repository that way, um, and then the standalone repo will still be the same. Okay, <clears throat> yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I can appreciate the Basil problems for sure. I think everybody probably can. <laughs> so splitting those apart was a big job for sure. So yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jay. Um, one quick moment. Uh, oops. Can? Yes. Yeah. Can I add a clarification on that? Um, yes, please. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so in the medium term, so thing, things will move to third party, but um, TensorFlow will still actually have like a, a copy of XLA in its third party directory. So it's going to be vendored there, just to clarify that. That okay. we're also trying to, to change. So it, it's taking a, like a, 
normal Bazel dependency, but because of Google 3 being a mono repo, um, that's the internal repository, um, syncing those up gets complicated. So just don't, don't be surprised if it's actually still a, a complete copy. So, so will that be staged then? So at, at first it'll move to third party as a copy and then eventually it'll just kind of fetch it at some point yes. in, the, in, the, in the further term? Yeah, that, that's the plan. Okay. But, but the thing that David's talking about that's going to be set up in the next couple of weeks, that's, it'll be like a copy in, in third party under TensorFlow. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, I think you're muted if you're. Thank you. I'm doing some uh, slide reshuffling last minute, um, but I think we should be good to go. Yes. Okay. Let me represent. Uh, I think you're muted. Uh. Okay. Next up, we have Eugene, um, who's going to talk about uh, the re latest release of Stable HLO um, version 0.9 and some of the updated uh, Stable HLO RFCs uh, that have come up in the community. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Taya. Uh, uh, well, uh, so, uh, as some of you know, uh, we recently had a blog post uh, that uh, talked about, uh, you know, general availability of OpenXLA. This was uh, a work uh, that consisted of, uh, you know, uh, advancing multiple projects, uh, including stable HLO, including the work that uh, that David just presented. And uh, one of the uh, one of the items uh, that uh, you know we, we released uh, towards that big update was uh, stable HLO 0.9. Uh, this is our first uh, official release. Uh, so the project existed uh, since uh, uh, existed on GitHub uh, uh, since uh, uh, July August uh, last year, and uh, all this time we were kind of bootstrapping it uh, from MHLO. Uh, we were uh, cleaning it up, and uh, but then I worked with uh, various uh, uh, with maintainers of various frontends and backends uh, to. Uh, to, to provide integrations. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the beginning of March, uh, we felt like uh, we're at a very good point uh, to, to, to announce this milestone uh, because uh, A, uh, stable HLO can now be produced by, uh, you know, all major uh, uh, ML frameworks. So some of those frameworks, uh, like JAX, for example, um, they, they support uh, stable HLO natively, uh, meaning that they generate it directly. Uh, Malyar is, is another example. And some uh, other uh, uh, some other frameworks uh, like TensorFlow and uh, PyTorch XLA, uh, they, they support uh, stable HLO through conversion uh, from, MHLO, uh, from HLO or MHLO. Uh, and uh, you know, there's, uh, there's ongoing migration. Similarly on the server side, uh, so both uh, PGRT and ERI uh, can take stable HLO inputs now. Uh, so we uh, we feel like this is, this is significant progress towards the goal of uh, building this uh, great portability layer between frameworks and compilers. And uh, the two major features that are included in this release, uh, 0 0.9, uh, also displayed here on the screen, uh, they're uh, comprehensive spec uh, and uh, compatibility guarantees. Uh, the spec, this is something that we talked about in the January community meeting. Uh, I, I won't go into too much detail. Uh, it's, uh, this work is inspired by XLA Operation Semantics, uh, which is a resource that uh, uh, some or many of you may know. And uh, it provides uh, basically further formalization for, uh, for the ops and uh, really, really comprehensive treatment of the semantics. So we, uh, for, for a couple quarters, uh, uh, you know, most of our team basically uh, went uh, spelunking uh, into uh, looking into every single HLO op, uh, trying to, to figure out semantics. 
that was a very interesting journey. Uh, we documented it so that uh, you know people don't have to read code uh, anymore uh, to understand how the ops work. And another uh, very important feature is compatibility guarantee uh, guarantees. Uh, that's uh, that's something that stable issue. This is new functionality provided by stable issue. We start with one month based on the RFC that we discussed in December. And uh, later this year, towards the end of the year, we're planning to release stable issue 1.0 and we'll scale up this guarantee towards uh, five years. Uh, so that, that's going to be a big jump. Um, so there's going to be quite a bit of preparation to make it happen. And we discussed this in the roadmap presentation uh, last month. Um, next slide, please. I also wanted to provide an update on stable issue RFCs. Uh, so February and March have been super productive for stable issue law. So we saw four RFCs opened uh, in about a month. That's great. And uh, these RFCs also served as a good stress test for our process because, uh, uh, next slide, uh, they very effectively asked the following questions. So first, how do we surface those RFCs to, to interested state, uh, stakeholders so that, you know, potential changes in stable issue law, they just, <clears throat> they, they happen involving everyone. Uh, also, if there are some open questions, if the next steps are unclear, how do we discuss them? And how do we have those discussions uh, publicly as a community? Because that's one of the goals of OpenXLA. Finally, you know, how do we eventually make decisions? So at the moment, we don't have an established precedent or existing process to guide us. So the, there is the uh, uh, recently accepted OpenXLA governance process. It's, uh, uh, it's been bootstrapped, so it's, it's not quite active, cannot help us just yet. So we've been playing it by year. And you know, frankly speaking, this playing by year, it, it hasn't resulted in a lot of visible process, uh, progress uh, for the stable issue RFCs. Some of them are open, for example, for, for more than a month. And uh, you know, I wanted to talk about this uh, in, in today's meeting because uh, I'd like to take responsibility for this and uh, personally commit to improving the situation. So here's what I'd like to propose. Uh, next slide. Um, to address the first item, uh, we uh, they, uh, will will talk about the new communication channels uh, that are proposed for the OpenXLA project, and uh, you know she, she'll talk about uh, the OpenXLA announce, OpenXLA discuss mailing lists. But basically, moving forward, we will be announcing project RFCs at OpenXLA discuss. So please subscribe to this mailing list as the source of truth uh, for all the changes uh, that will be going on with Stable Issue. Uh, now, addressing items two, three, and four, it will be, uh, you know, more challenging. That will require more work, and next steps will also build on uh, what what uh, is about to present uh, later today. Uh, basically, the the summary, so that I don't steal uh, the thunder, uh, is that uh, we will be working on bootstrapping core maintainers for the OpenXLA project and module maintainers for individual modules like Stable Issue, and so. Uh, that's that's all consistent with the with the governance process uh, that we discussed in December and then uh, approved in January. And uh, you know, once this is done with the input from all of you, then stable issue module maintainers will figure out the, the RFC process for stable issue. I'll give an example uh, for for a process that would improve the the current situation. Uh, and this is just an example, not something that has been decided because we don't yet have people who would decide that. We don't have module maintainers. So anyway, here's an example process. Uh, so first, RFC is submitted for review by someone from the community. Then within a week, one of the module maintainers is responsible for providing feedback to make sure that things move uh, quickly. And of course, community members are welcome to provide feedback anytime, of course. And then within two weeks, we have a community meeting where everyone has an opportunity to discuss things in real time, in addition to what was uh, talked about in writing. And so at this meeting, uh, module maintainers uh, aim to make a decision, approve the RFC, reject it, or give actionable feedback. So uh, by putting uh, this, uh, these timelines in the process, uh, we would ensure that uh, you know, there is always progress being made. That's just one way of doing this. As I said, this is not something that has been decided like a straw person, uh, but you know, just to give an example. So anyway, uh, the, uh, the goal of this as discussed at the December meeting when the OpenXLA governance process was introduced. Within OpenXLA, we're aiming to establish uh, uh, this <clears throat> the situation, uh, this environment that allows decisions to be made effectively and inclusively. 
So please consider me being on the hook for making sure that this happens for stable issue as soon as possible. Next slide. So while all this work is going on, I also wanted to make sure that we start making uh, progress on active RFCs. And so towards that end, uh, you know, here's what I propose. So both the sparsity RFC and the aligning stable issue on TOS RFC have been presented at the community meeting in February. Still, there are some open questions that prevent us from making a decision on them right now. And I'll work on surfacing these questions on GitHub ASAP. So there have been some discussions, not all of them, uh, you know, are summarized and present there on GitHub. This is what, what I'll address. So please use the subscribe functionality for this co corresponding pull requests on GitHub if you're interested in staying in touch. So there are links to, to, to all those RFCs. And of course, you know, as I said earlier, uh, everyone is welcome to provide feedback anytime as well, uh, regardless of like all sorts of processes and all. Uh, but you can just drop by on GitHub uh, or on the mailing list and then uh, you know provide feedback. So please do that on those or other pull requests if you have further thoughts. Uh, now the last two RFCs on the table, backward compatibility and uh, the, the recent FP8 RFC, they seem to be easier to evaluate because they both piggyback on already approved uh, proposals. So those RFCs were both sent for review about two weeks ago. I propose we keep them open for one more week uh, until you know Friday, uh, March 24th, and then approve if there's no blocking feedback. All right, so that's everything that I wanted to share about stable issue RFCs, uh, some proposals, how to make the overall uh, process more smooth uh, while we're bootstrapping OpenXLA governance. And uh, please let us know what you think, either here right now or in Discord afterwards. Looking forward to your feedback and thank you everyone for your patience as we're starting this out. I think that's it, uh, Taya, on my part. Awesome, thank you, Eugene. Um, yes, I'm excited to talk, uh, follow up on some of the things that Eugene talked about today. Um, but first, uh, we're going to be hearing from um, Anoush. Uh, Anoush, are you here with us? Yeah, I'm ready. Awesome. Okay, great. Um, so Anoush has a new RFC out um, specific to Erie covering heterogeneous um, devices in Erie. Um, we have an RFC doc. Uh, should I present that, Anoush? Yeah, I think that'll be easier. Okay. Okay. All right. I believe uh, the doc's being presented. Yeah, yeah, we can see it. Um, so I'll, I'll just set the context for this. Uh, I think this is mostly a, a precursor to uh, problems we want to solve and kind of like get a, a community feedback loop on use cases uh, because this is a, a complex and uh, you know involved uh, design. So so I think we just want to try and like socialize the idea of what we are trying to do where we're coming from, what we want to solve uh, for end customers, and then uh, and then leave it open for like, you know, comments and, and feedback, and then kind of like take a more detailed um, RFC and, and kind of go through the process. Um, so just for some context, uh, we at Nord are shipping thousands of um, installs of uh, OpenXLA Erie, uh, Torch Dynamo, Torch MLIR, uh, all packaged in, in a single EXE, and it's going out to you know um, literally thousands of Windows users that just run stable diffusion. Uh, we are adding uh, large language model support. Um, so uh, you know, thanks to the community, we you know I think we've put together an end-to-end -end flow, um, and we've been involved with this uh, community for like two years or more than two years now. Uh, so it's finally good to see it all coming together. Um, one of the things that we do notice that uh, we get pulled towards is like sort of models and like fast moving infrastructure that uh, ED uh, can be tweaked to adapt to and, and target uh, new hardware. Uh, so as a, as a, a business, we've kind of enabled more than 10 plus um, ED backends with custom accelerators. Um, not all of it is public, but you can, uh, any silicon we, we, we've kind of seen um, and, and have ERI running on, which, which uh, talks to the architecture and the, the extensibility of the framework. Uh, but now what we are trying to do is trying to take what we had running on the single accelerators or, or a cluster of accelerators, but try and distribute them across um, larger 
um, you know, heterogeneous uh, uh, compute infrastructure. Um, and it's not just heterogeneous compute infrastructure. There's like a layered, you know, just oversubscription of existing uh, GPUs. So you can think of having one uh, NVIDIA 4090 or an AMD 7900 XTX, and you try to run the latest Llama model um, on it. And that's like 65 billion parameters. And they have only 25 or uh, 24 gigs of um, memory. Um, and so we have to, you know, actively move in and uh, out uh, memory and data. Um, so so th this document is just a starting point for discussions. Anyone who wants to uh, edit access or comment access, please request it. I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Um, so that's the top level. There's some work that has been done on something called FlexGen uh, with OPT models. Um, and, and, and it's referenced in this document. Uh, they, you know, kind of uh, highlighted some techniques around quantization comp compression uh, and also lazy loading of weights uh, to oversubscribe. So it's a, it's a, um, it's good paper to read. Uh, but we can scroll down a little bit and and and, and feel free to stop me anywhere. This is just um, you know um, free form. Hey, we're we're working on this. Uh, we're here to hear from you, and um, and we have end customer requests for this. So we are going to solve it we just want to make sure everyone's you know uh, aware of how we're going to go and, and get guidance from everyone in the community so that we do it in the right way um so this is just a very uh simple diagram i put together uh in terms of like you know the io we want to delay the io until the compute is required right so uh so we want to be able to oversubscribe um, here I call it vGPUs to make it very abstract, but it doesn't have to be a GPU. It can be at dispatch level. It can be uh, at tensor level. Uh, but fundamentally, we want to move. We want to late bind the um, I/O uh, and and move it in just in time for the compute to be scheduled. Um, and the compute uh, and the I/O can traverse multiple devices. Right, so it can come from SSD to uh, CPU RAM from CPU RAM to the GPU, GPU um, uh, VRAM to shared memory, and then we run the compute uh, as required, and then we kind of have to propagate the weights back. Um, so there's some level of orchestration that goes on with this. Um, and we can scroll down a little bit. Um, and uh, again, feel free to um, you know, interrupt anytime. Um, I think one of the things that we want to add is uh, add multi-device support. Uh, today we have demonstrations of Bloom 176 billion parameters running via Erie on 16 GPUs. Um, and, and we do all of that. We are orchestrated at a higher level. So we have 16 instances of Erie uh, driving each one of the GPUs. And then we kind of like, you know, orchestrate in the Python layer. Um, it would be uh, interesting to understand is that uh, that's one way to do it, but if we had that uh, kind of aware at the EV level, um, would would the scheduling across those GPUs be something to um, you know uh, do in one runtime? Um, so the next one is obviously what we um, talked about with just-in-time loading of weights. Uh, here's a diagram from Yi Wang, who is um, uh, who put this together for an iPhone GPT-2 fine-tuning. Where he's trying to load in weights and unload weights um, in uh, for for it to be available just in time because he cannot expand the uh, 3 GB of memory he has uh, of the RAM that he has that's being shared between the GPU and CPU. Um, we can scroll down a little more, and then um, yeah, and then this just gets to what our end customers want. Again, this is just a wall of text here uh, with the with a prototype that we've done in Python. Uh, with Erie, and um, we're, like I mentioned, we've run Bloom 176 billion uh, across 16 GPUs. It can run on CUDA, it can run on Intel Flex, it can run on other devices, um, and it's functional, but I think it's um, very uh, naively partitioned at like, uh, you know, we, we partition the whole 176 billion into 70 blocks. We, we compile them into different MLIR uh, chunks, and then we just load them, unload them as required. And Eri is not aware of any of the, you know, data movement that's happening ahead uh, uh, before Eri gets called. Uh, but we'd like that to be late binding at the dispatch level, uh, so that we can pull in the weights as required. Um, and and this is not just for large language models. The um, primary model that we ship is stable diffusion, and there are 
customers with 4G and 4GB and 8GB GPUs that are unable to use it um, because you know UNet has finished running and it's still in memory. But then the VAE comes in and it blows up and they they're unable to use it. So if you look at the Nordia Discord, you'll see a lot of those complaints. Uh, right now we're doing we're, we're planning to give like hey we'll inference UNet will remove it then we'll put VAE will remove it. But that's all like you know top level um, orchestration. What we'd like to do is try and get um, you know, um, get it in in line in the EV runtime itself. Um, so I'll save you know um, this chunk of text uh, for uh, for you to read uh, at your leisure. But uh, we can go down to the next two, and, um, and then we can, as, as we discussed, we can uh, think. Um, oh, uh, good! I haven't seen this diagram. <laughs> I think one of our guys added it yesterday, but uh, but it's good. Um, but I think uh, uh, it, it basically just comes down to um, how much can we um, like? Can we oversubscribe memory, and can we use hierarchical memory? And here, memory can be uh, storage also, uh, but can we use it in a late binding way? That just like how we express compute dependencies, can we express I/O dependencies across devices so that when that compute dependency is being done in device? It, the, the 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 corresponding memory uh, has been accessed from SSD, moved to RAM, moved to the GPU, et cetera, et cetera. And, and we expose that as knobs if required, so we can tune how much of your system RAM we want to use uh, for this caching or, or for this prefetching. Um, so these are all like solid computer science problems that uh, we can you know geek out on, but at the same time, we want to make sure that in the end we have to you know ship something that we can oversubscribe this so so we just have to find a good um you know um uh balance and data caching is an extension of that too um but uh, here's an example if you scroll down a little more um if you do multiple batch sizes uh you could potentially do some sort of like um you know schedule where you keep you do multiple batches while the um data is in memory um, because right now you just do what's in front row by row for batch size of one, you have to do row by row. But if you do a batch size of 64 or something where you're inferencing for a server um, or, or whatever the batch size is, then you have some more optimizations that you can do um, like uh, in the in the zigzag block schedule. Uh, this is from the, uh, the flex gen paper. Um, so that's three. And then uh, just quickly talk about four and five, and then we can just have free form uh, chat. Um, this is a little more, um, and, and this Tracy profile, I think, doesn't do just what I was trying to explain. But, but basically, there are some um, use cases like stable diffusion itself has schedulers in the middle of GPU work that has some complex, like it's a wild west of, um, you know, some sci-fi plus this plus that and you know um it, like it's just highly experimental and usually it's element wise uh some operation that can best be done on the cpu um uh, that gets interleaved in between 50 gpu runs uh we have tried to move that work into the gpu once it's stabilized so we know euler discrete uh, scheduler will make a gpu version of it we can send it down and have everything run on the gpu but the field is moving so fast that we want the ability for the research, research, researchers to get as much performance on the GPU, but at the same time experiment with new schedulers that run on the CPU. And so what we're trying to do is see how we can interleave that on, on CPU and GPU um, kind of workloads. And that gives us to 0.5, which is there may be accelerators in the CPU complex that we could use uh, if we scroll down a little more, like, uh, you know, like the Grace Hopper kind of architecture or similar architectures where we can accelerate something on the CPU and on the GPU, but we want fine-grained scheduling of both of that, uh, the same work scheduling, work scheduling scheduler level that is available in the ERI runtime. We want to expose the entire heterogeneity of the chip and add in caching and data locality, et cetera, um, and, and streaming of the memory data is what we are trying to eventually solve. Um, for now, these are just orchestrated in Python with like block level, you know, um, hacks. And, and there are some examples at the bottom that we have on how we are running that. That's the high level summary of what we have. And happy to answer any questions. And, and I know we, this is a big topic. We're going to have follow-ons and, and more discussions in a, in a uh, principled way. But 
uh, but happy to answer any high level questions. That uh, that certainly covers a lot of uh, a lot of territory across uh, classical, you know, horizontal scaling down to, you know, layered partitioning, you know, to to more uh, more leverage uh, newer device classes. I think we'd need to piece it apart and and look at which layers of the stack are uh, you know can be can be used to solve solve different problems. But um, you know, I would say that. Uh, Erie itself probably is more in the realm of number four and five on your on your comment uh, comment list. You know, this is this is uh, hardware that is presenting a unified CPU GPU surface or a unified unified you know GPU excel CPU accelerator surface or something, and um, making sure that we have in in one program the ability to to address both of those and you know create a program that that optimally uses that should be a pretty good end goal. Um, I, uh, yeah, with this, like the, the, these use cases cover, cover a lot of, a lot of room and there's some, some existing assets for some of this and some of it's baked in to other things needs to be extracted, but, um, we're going to need to come up with a way to break down the use cases into platform features and layers. Uh, and there's a lot of overlap on that with, you know, a lot of things that are going on in the horizontal scaling uh, domain. So those are just high level comments. Yeah, ag agreed. And I'm, I'm excited to, to work through that. I think getting a little working group set up so that we can kind of break, break these things down would be good because I think some of them are already possible today. Uh, like the async custom module example will get you pretty far with this stuff. Um, so I think, I think if we, we can stage this stuff out such that we could probably do a lot of this in experimental out of tree samples, you know, hack things together, um, especially as we start to use things like GPU direct and, and vendor APIs that uh, I don't, very few people have used, <laughs> you know, like a, a lot of these APIs, you, you Google them and you find zero hits. So um, I, think, I think if we can, can break this stuff down, get a couple little projects set up to test individual features um, and then see, see where things land from there, it'd be, be pretty awesome. Yep. Thank you for presenting, Anush, and thank you, everyone at Nod, for putting this together. Um, I'm excited for all these use cases. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so, Anush, am I right that the best, so the best path forward seems to be um, in short-term comments on the ROC doc um, that I've linked to in chat will also be linked to um, from the slide deck. Um, and I suppose uh, we'll move forward with creating working groups on in an ad hoc manner. Uh, Stella, do yeah. you have an opinion? I, 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 think, I think Jacques has proposed um, that in a couple of weeks, we'll have another session and, and uh, so Jacques can um, comment on it. But, but yeah, this can act as a place to just gather any input right now until the next uh, follow on kind of like working group meets. But Jacques, you had an idea on that. Yeah, and so I think Ben actually summarized it quite well, like on chat as well, and even Stella here, that there's, you know, quite a few different folks involved. Um, Erie side, you know, like I think that's also good to sort of like pull that apart a little bit in in a, in a you know a dedicated meeting. Um, but definitely, I, I think we'll we'll need to, you know, break it up a bit into the work groups and, and work items. Um, but the idea is sort of in two weeks to have a bit more of a um, a discussion at least like from like the, the, like the section we think like Erie may be able to um, um, help with most um, but then yeah definitely more follow-up discussions and interview here. Yeah I um, I think that this the style of RFC you know uh, doesn't isn't uh, an RFC for a specific feature it's almost an RFC for a for an entire program and um, and one of the one of the things that uh, that this this kind of discussion over the coming weeks can be good for is is getting the um, finding the fellow travelers the people who need to come together on that and uh, and that's you know re rather than like here's the RFC okay let's do the implementation this is this is really a how do we how do we surface the the people in the community and in Google that that have a have a piece of this and and you know need to be involved in in prototyping activities and whatnot. Awesome. 
Um, so actually that uh, and mentioning a follow on meeting is a good segue into um, what I'll be covering next. Let me share updated slides. Um, here. Okay, great. So um, on to the community news section um, where we give some meta level updates for what's going on in the project and how we all work together. Um, one of the main things I wanted to talk about today was um, updates to our communication channels. Um, so we typically have this graph at the beginning of the meeting, um, but I wanted to push it down to call out some new uh, channels that we've created and um, some channels we have are planning to deprecate. So we're still obviously um, using the same GitHub repos for, for everything in the project. The main news is that um, we've created two mailing lists that are hosted on our openxla.org domain. And we don't have a website yet, but that is in the works. Um, and we have two mailing lists. One is OpenXLA Discuss. I anticipate this being used basically for any project updates um, discussions about meeting agendas, um, RFC announcements, release updates, and any kind of, you know, more asynchronous um, questions or topics that the community wants to raise. That's obviously a two-way um, mailing list. Anyone is free to join. The nice thing about this mailing list and joining it is that you will be automatically added um, as an invite to the, the project level community meetings. Um, so I know a lot of folks have been asking how to join community meetings. Um, joining that mailing list is the best way to do so. And you won't get blocked on, on anybody in particular adding you to a calendar invite. Um, we have another mailing list, OpenXLA Announce. This is uni unidirectional. And basically, um, for people who aren't ready to you know, super dig into the project but want to know if there are upcoming major events, uh, major releases, or um, you know, milestone blog posts, that's where we will be pushing out that information. Um, so please do join um, and pass that mailing list along to anyone you know who wants to keep tabs on, on the biggest news going on in the OpenXLA project. We also have two Discord servers now that Erie has joined. Um, for now, we plan to keep uh, them as two servers. Um, we may revisit that in the future, uh, TBD. If we do so, we'll talk about it on OpenXLA Discuss. Um, but essentially, the OpenXLA Discord server right now um, is for synchronous dis uh, discussions for the overall OpenXLA project, um, and also for specifically um, stable HLO and XLA uh, as standalone components. Um, the Erie Discord server has been around for quite a while. It has a very active community, um, and this is where we plan on um, uh, for now, um, having synchronous discussions specific to Erie show up. Um, so, you know, point of nuance is, okay, and where do I talk about stable HLO if it's in the context of stable HLO being used with Erie? Um, both places are okay. We're going to have a um, stable HLO uh, channel on Erie Discord as a front end. Um, but again, the majority of the synchronous discussions around stable HLO on its own um, and in, in general uh, will happen on the OpenXLA Discord server. If this is totally confusing, um, bear with us and we appreciate your feedback. Um, I'm planning on producing a lightweight RFC around, does this work for the community? Um, is there anything we should be thinking about as we uh, think about merging or discontinuing some of our um, communication channels. Um, and a, an important note in terms of deprecation, we will no longer be using GitHub discussions. Um, I'm going to go through the process of, of reminding people that we're not going to use it who previously contributed and then closing those discussions down. Um, it, it hasn't really worked for our community so far. Um, and we think that a, a more centralized and less fragmented mailing list is the way to go um, forward from here. Um, oops. Uh, go back. Okay. Okay. Um, community meetings are still monthly. Again, they'll include um, Erie updates going forward. Um, and again, we'll we'll look at creating um, either ad hoc or regular, uh, more developer-focused sessions 
um, for different components or just to dig into RFCs like the one uh, that Anoush presented today. Um, and then for all community meetings, we have a shared Google Drive that's fully open to the public and readable to um, non-members of the OpenXLA Discuss group. Um, but I believe that if you're in OpenXLA Discuss, you have the ability to add files. I'm not 100% sure about that yet, so I'll have to uh, clarify. But basically, this is where we're going to start uploading all of the um, docs coming out of this meeting, any shared docs um, that, that shouldn't live or, or have you know analogs in GitHub. And um, we've also recently added project logos there. Um, so basically, all the community assets that that should be easy to, to um, grab from the community uh, will be shared there. Um, again, publicly available, anyone can read it, whether or not you have a Google login. All right, so I'm going to, in the interest of time, move forward, because um, I also wanted to announce um, kind of our, our biggest net new governance update um, since the governance um, proposal was accepted earlier this year. Um, we're going to establish an OpenXLA interim steering committee. And essentially um, what this is, is a group of Google maintainers um, of OpenXLA. The people who make up this group are existing maintainers of different components. They have you know, developer track records in, in GitHub and are actively involved in the community. Um, and their main goal is basically just to bootstrap the OpenXLA governance um, model that we released and approved earlier this year. This is a temporary bootstrapping committee. I wanted to emphasize that a couple of times. If we're doing our job well, it will not exist for very long. Um, and we can move forward with uh, the project governance we outlined, um, including uh, core maintainer group um, and all that good stuff. Um, so in the interim, our scope is to establish any of the uh, governance processes, um, the initial drafts of them, that is, that will unblock us making progress against formalizing governance in the project. Um, I've opened a PR against this, so please take a look. I've listed some of the in-scope and out-of-scope things that, that we see this um, committee addressing in the short term. We'll probably delegate as much as possible um, to uh, other um, more uh, long-term governance groups if we get at all bogged down. Um, and just like we oh, just like we would like to do in the eventual core maintainers group and module maintainers group, we work by consensus basis. Um, we meet regularly. Um, the minutes of our meetings won't be public for this particular group. However, um, we will be working in PRs and issues in the open XLA uh, community repo and also welcome issues against um, community process there as well. Um, if you need to get in touch with us, you can email openxla steering at openxla.com where only um, the steering group members will be. Um, and you know this is a good channel if you want to um, provide feedback on how the governance rollout is going on or provide any escalations for things that are going on in the community before the core maintainer group is established. And these are um, all of the members today. Um, and we tried really hard again to make sure that all uh, components in OpenXLA were represented and that these are all folks that you have seen before um, and are actively contributing um, and part of the community. Yes. Um, so I see that still has a question about your discuss mailing list. Um, I can answer that, but wanted to see if there were any other questions about the interim steering committee. Great. Um, okay, so Erie Discuss mailing list, it does exist. I believe there was talk about maybe um, smushing it into the OpenXLA Discuss um, mailing list as well. This will be part of the RFC um, because I know that it is not trivial to port discussions from one place to another and Google Groups does not make that functionality um, easy. Uh, so. In the meantime, everyone who's already on the Erie Discuss mailing list, don't worry. If we make any changes, uh, we will provide an abundance of heads up and opportunity for feedback. 
Um, and it may just be that we have an ERE specific mailing list on the openxla.org um, uh, domain. So they can all be managed in one place. Awesome, okay. So on to blogs and events, I know we're running out of time. I didn't want to not mention our general availability blog, um, which came out, uh, I believe two weeks ago. This was a huge effort from many of the people on this call. Um, and we were so excited uh, to have this news out um, in, the, in the ecosystem. I have not linked to it, but I will from this slide. And also we took that opportunity of publishing that blog to create a Twitter account. Um, hopefully that was a good idea. If you would like to follow us on Twitter, um, please do so. And also um, feel free to share on Discord if you have a tweet that we, you think the OpenXLA uh, account should be retweeting. And finally, um, I wanted to uh, announce a call for interest for an OpenXLA developer meetup. I mentioned this before, um, we've been super busy and so no longer think we will be able to pull off like an official um, very formal user summit. However, we are still uh, very interested in hosting um, a more informal developer meetup on April 27th, but we won't hold it unless people show up. So please do fill out the form that I've linked to from here. I'll also blast this on a couple of other channels, um, but let us know if you'd be able to attend, if you'd be interested in speaking, or if you'd prefer um, to, to attend future events um, that we have a little bit more um, leeway to plan for. And that is the end of our meeting. Um, just a reminder, I'm going to get the, um, the recording of this up on YouTube. I will send it to the OpenXLA Discuss mailing list, um, along with a link to our public channel, our, our public uh, sl slides, where they live in. Okay, anyway, <laughs> I'll post everything to OpenXLA Discuss. Um, and you can grab the recording and the slides from there.